Thank you so much, Dr. Norris. Uh, I would say the feeling is very mutual. I very much enjoy working with you and have learned a lot. And it's a relatively new relationship, so I'm sure we will get to learn a lot more from each other. Um, so I'm going to talk about lifestyle to support mental health. Um, and if you're on social media, you can follow me at PhD underscore Lee. My main platform is Twitter, but I also use Instagram. And I'm going to start opening with the idea of whole health. Um, so the idea of whole health is that you are a whole person and every part of your health is important. Every part of your well-being is important to making sure that you are living your best life. And what does that look like? Well, the center of that is your purpose. Why do you get up in the morning? What gets you excited? Um, so you have to have something that's driving you to do things in life. So that's number one. And then supporting your purpose are all these things around it. So we've got natural movement, moving throughout the day your environment, uh, whether you have everything you need if you're in a healthy environment, nutrition, are you fueling yourself for everything you need to do throughout the day? And recharging, are you giving yourself time to recharge your battery so you have all of, of the energy that you need to do your purpose? Support and belonging, do you have a social network that helps you with your stress, helps you feel fulfilled, um, and you feel like you've found your tribe? And all of this comes into prevention. So we wanna prevent disease as part of our general health. Now, how do we do that? There are three main elements. One is self-care, the other is clinical care, and then your communities. So today we're gonna to talk about all three of these, but I will probably focus mostly on self-care for the purposes of this talk. So recharging versus chronic stress. So you need to recharge so you can prevent chronic stress. Stress is actually unavoidable. And it's not something you can just say, all right, I'm not going to have stress, so my life is going to be perfect. Uh, but what happens is it's how you deal with your stress that matters. So you need to manage your stress. Um, and that's where the recharge element of the whole health comes in. So you need to give yourself time to recharge your batteries. And that's especially important in preventing chronic stress, which can lead to things like burnout uh, and other really negative things that we don't even want to go there, right? So we're going to just manage our stress, um, but we are not going to avoid stress. We're going to manage it, not avoid it. So what does chronic stress do to you? It can actually affect your mood. It's been linked to depressive symptoms and we have a potential biochemical mechanism behind that with decreased brain-derived neurotropic factor or BDNF for short. And for those of you who are really interested in the biochemistry of this, I've got a little graphic for you here to give you a little teaser and also uh, the link or the um, reference for the citation here. So you can look it up. It's a great read, I highly recommend it. So if we know that decreased BDNF is, is linked to chronic stress and some of these mood issues, how do we increase our BDNF? Well, the great news is it's relatively easy and it all ties into whole health. So what do you do first? You have regular physical activity and exercise. That's the natural movement. And you can choose anything. There's three great options here in this figure. Uh, hole hooping is wonderful fun. That's probably also going to help. Um, and here you're doing something together and being social, that's probably also going to help. So if you could add on layers to this physical activity and exercise, then you're doing even more good for your whole health and helping you recharge from that chronic stress. Diet is also important. There are things called phytonutrients, which are plant chemicals. Um, and they've been linked to increasing BDNF, particularly curcumin, which is found in turmeric. So if you're having an Indian curry, you are probably getting some turmeric and hopefully that will help increase your BDNF and make you a little more resilient. How else do we manage our stress? So lifestyle plays a large part of this and we're gonna talk more about this, but so I'm not skipping over lifestyle at all. Um, but what we're gonna start with is saying, what not to do. Don't rely on alcohol. It's something that you hear on television all the time. Oh, I had such a hard day, I need to have a drink. And while that may temporarily make you feel better, it's not helping actually managing your stress and may lead to even more stressful situations um, if you are not taking care of your stress management in a more positive way. So what should you do? You have to figure this out for yourself. What really recharges you? Are you an introvert and you need some quiet time? We actually all need quiet time every once in a while. I'm sure especially parents right now in the pandemic, they need some quiet time. Um, do you need to get out in nature? Nature has been shown to do amazing things for stress management. It lowers your blood pressure, decreases your cortisol. So getting out in nature is probably something good to consider. Socializing, that goes back to the support network in your whole health. You need to have people around you. Human beings are social creatures. We are not meant to be isolated, which uh, the pandemic has really brought out in a lot of people. So we have to be creative in socializing sometimes. And that could be over Zoom, it could be a phone call. Um, it could be just sending someone a quick text, very simple little things, just so you know that there's someone there for you um, and your network is there. 
And also sweating it out. That's something I love to do when I'm really stressed. I actually have specific yoga routines that I do when I'm really stressed out because they're like really intense and I'm like screaming and we're, we're doing lion's breath and you have to sometimes just get that, that anxiety out. Um, so find, figure out which works for you is the most important, but I do think having a variety of, of types of approaches are important as well, because you have different types of stress and different types of anxiety and different types of emotions. Sometimes you're feeling more lethargic and you don't have the energy to say work out. So that quiet time might be the right approach. Okay, how else do we recharge? Restorative sleep. I actually started my research career in sleep, and I do think it's a foundational element to health. If you don't sleep, you're not letting your body refresh itself. You're not letting your brain process everything that happened the previous day. We have to get enough sleep. Um, and what does that mean? First, having a regular sleep schedule, going to bed at the same time and getting up at the same time day or every day after day, and that includes weekends, which is probably going to throw a lot of you for a loop. Um, but that's what we call social jet lag when you're shifting your time scale on the weekends. And by doing that, it's the same as if you went to California or if you went to, uh, you know, a different time zone that you literally are causing yourself to have the effects of jet lag. And we've all experienced jet lag and know that it's not a pleasant thing. So why do we do that to ourselves week upon week upon week? It's a great question. Something to consider. Um, but the most important thing is that you're getting seven to nine hours of restorative sleep. What does that mean? It means you're going to bed, you're going to sleep relatively quickly, you're not laying there too long, uh, you're waking up in the morning and you're feeling rested. That, that's the most important part. You're feeling rested when you wake up. And the easiest way to do that is to have this regular sleep schedule, give yourself enough time. So don't say, oh, I need seven hours of sleep and I'm gonna to go to bed at 11 and wake up at six because you're not giving yourself that time to get settled in and relax. Um, so giving yourself extra time and make sure you're getting the full amount of sleep that you need. And there is some variation on that. Uh, another way to be really promoting restorative sleep is to have a routine that signals it's time to wind down for the day. We'll call this a wind down routine. And it's something that you do every night before you go to bed, something that's relaxing and something that lets your body know, okay, it's time to shut down and we don't need to be up and excited and we don't need to be thinking about everything that happened throughout the day. And how do we do this? Or what should we do during this wind down routine? I got a few suggestions here, uh, listening to relaxing music, you could read a book, but not a thriller because you don't want to be up and excited. You need something that's relatively relaxing. Taking a bath is a great one. And a bonus if you add lavender in to it because that's an aromatherapy that actually produces sleep hormones. Uh, another thing that I think is really powerful and people probably aren't utilizing enough is meditation and breathing practices. And that could be as simple as just taking a deep breath in and taking a deep breath out. You probably already feel better just from that. Uh, or you could do something like visualization or if you pray. Um, and something that I recommend and I personally use is yoga nidra, which sounds really fancy, but it's not. <laughs> it's basically just a body scan. Um, and there are lots of free resources. This is one that I particularly like, doyogawithme.com. Um, and they just walk you through looking over your entire body, visualiz visualizing wise, you're not physically looking at your body and just relaxing it. So it, it, you think about each finger and relaxing each finger and that's great for getting your body ready to go to sleep. So I personally recommend that one, but it's all about finding what works for you. How else do we promote restful sleep? Uh, one is limiting caffeine to the morning. So caffeine is a very powerful stimulant and it actually has a pretty long half-life. It stays in your system for six to eight hours. So you can think of if you're having it at you know, two or three in the afternoon, then it's still in your system when you're trying to go to sleep. So it will be affecting your sleep, let alone having it in the evening, which is probably not a good idea. Even if you don't think it affects your sleep, it does affect your sleep, at least to some extent. Another really important and super easy one is to enjoy the daylight. Let your body know it's daylight outside by going outside in the morning, preferably before 10 a.m. and getting sunshine in your eyes. You are literally resetting your circadian rhythms. You are telling your body's internal clock that it is daytime. Um, so what I like to do is I go out in the morning, take my sunglasses off, right? That's important to have the sunglasses off and just say good morning to the world, right? Look at, look at the plants, look at the sky. And now you've started your day and hopefully taken a, a moment to, to rest yourself in the process. And that will let you sleep better that evening. What happens if you can't sleep? Cause it does happen to everyone at least now and again. 
Uh, a lot of times we'll try and lay in bed and just, you know, grit through it and say, we're going to go to sleep. That doesn't work. It really doesn't work. <laughs> um, so it's better for you actually to get up out of bed and do something relaxing. So something maybe that you do in your wind down routine. So again, you're signaling to your body, this is a time for us to wind down. We don't need to be thinking. We don't need to be running around doing things. This is a time for us to settle down and then go back to bed and try again. If you still can't sleep, melatonin supplements can actually be beneficial um, for occasional sleeplessness. Uh, and they are also helpful when shifting time zones. So if you're, you're getting home and you can't sleep because you're on a different time zone, melatonin may be helpful for that as well. And they're also very inexpensive. So what sabotages our sleep? A lot of these things are things people just routinely do and don't even think about. So using their bed for something else, right? So you're reading or you're watching TV in your bed. Now that's told your body that the bed is not just for sleeping. The bed is for also reading or watching TV. And so when you go to bed, now your body is saying, well, maybe we feel like reading or maybe we feel like watching TV as opposed to thinking now is the time for me to sleep and recharge. So you really need to treat the bed as a special place for your body to know that this is where we will recharge every night. And in kind and maybe counterintuitively, napping can actually also sleep sabotage. And what it does that by disrupting your circadian rhythms. Uh, if your nap is under 30 minutes, not a problem. It doesn't disrupt your sleep rhythms at all, surprisingly, and may actually make you feel a lot better. Um, but if it's longer than that, it can really disrupt your rhythms unless it's something you do routinely. So some people are nappers and they'll take a, a 30 minute to an hour nap every single day. And that has become part of the routine. That may actually be okay, but it really is going to depend on the individual. Another important thing about sleeping is your bedroom. It needs to be a sanctuary. There, there shouldn't be a lot of noise. It should be really quiet. You don't want any light, any light at all. So even this alarm clock over here is probably putting light out that bothers you. See how he has it facing himself? If he had it facing away from him and the light wasn't in his eyes, that would be better. And that's a pretty small change. Another is temperature, being too hot or too cold. It's important that you feel very comfortable and that you're not sweating or you're not freezing and shivering. Um, and getting that just right, I know, can be kind of difficult, especially as these seasons are changing right now. So that can be a sleep disruption as the, the seasons are changing and we're not having changed our bedroom over for the summer, um, but it's hot in the evening. Um, so do think about how you can make sure that you're gonna be comfortable all night long. Uh, another one is alcohol. Uh, and it's, especially three hours before bed, which is probably longer than most people would think. Uh, if you have it immediately before bed, it will disrupt your sleep cycle. Despite what popular culture might lead you to believe, oh, I need to have a few drinks so I can sleep. I need to have a nightcap. That doesn't really work. Um, and I think a lot of people probably intuitively know this if they've ever drank a little bit too much and they wake up bright eyed at 3 a.m. It's because you've disturbed your sleep cycle. Uh, and while the alcohol in that case may have helped you fall asleep, uh, it certainly is going to keep you awake the rest of the night. So don't rely on alcohol to help you sleep. Um, and, and any other kind of stimulating activities as well. So uh, we're all addicted to our phones. <laughs> we we want to be checking email. We want to be watching something on YouTube. And that's all well and good during the day. But immediately prior to sleep, that is going to disrupt your sleep cycle. The blue light that's coming out of them and just the fact that it's a stimulating, mentally stimulating activity is going to sabotage your sleep, which is why it's important to have that wind down routine. So what might this look like if we were to draw a timeline of how do you get a great night's sleep? So it starts way before sleep, right? We've got six hours before bedtime. That's when you need to stop drinking caffeine. And that's pretty conservative. It, it potentially could be longer than that to really be sure that it's all out of your system, depending on how quickly you metabolize caffeine. Then three hours before bedtime, we're stopping drinking. Uh, and the same thing for exercising. You don't wanna be doing that too close to bed just because it's very stimulating. Um, unless maybe you were doing like a gentle yoga or Tai Chi or something that's more relaxing, in which case that would be totally okay. Another important thing is to stop eating prior to bed. And I know we talk about having a midnight snack or having you know, milk before bed, but that's actually probably not a great idea because it's causing your body to go into digestion mode, which is while as important, it can't do rest and digest at the same time. Uh, so you have to give it time to digest before you get into the rest. Turning off electronics, we talked about that. At least, this one says at least one hour before bed. Um, I think that's probably reasonable. 
And at that point, you want to stop working, studying, and stressing. Now, how do you stop stressing? Uh, great recommendation to list or journal. So if you are worried that you're going to forget to do something, write it down. I started using Google Tasks, and now I can just add things quickly to that whenever I'm thinking about it so I don't have to stress that I'm going to forget. Um, journaling is also beneficial to, to look back on your day. Uh, I particularly like to focus on the positive aspects of my day, being grat grateful and what went well. Uh, and just setting things, that time aside for journaling can also be really beneficial. Make that part of your wind down routine. Uh, and then of course you could also do yoga nidra. So this could be a great time to do that as well. And then hopefully you're getting into bed and having a great night's sleep. So moving on to another element of whole health, natural movement. And I would say that movement is actually self-care. And that might not be something that we typically think of. Um, but if you think of it in this vein, that motion is lotion and motion is lotion for body, mind, and spirit. Now it starts to sound like self-care, doesn't it? It's something you need to do for you, for your health, for your well-being. And one of my favorite people in the world of natural movement is Katty Bowman, Nutritious Movement. Uh, and she has this great quote on her website. A movement rich life is one that keeps all of you moving, arms, legs, even your microbiome, gives you large doses of vitamin nature and vitamin community, adds movement back into your everyday life. And I think that really sums up everything you need to know about natural movement. And it's something you need to do throughout the day. It's not something that you, you know, I only do it one hours, one hour a day when I go to the gym. It's something that has to be part of, just part of your day. Uh, and what do I mean by that is there's actually some research showing that if you don't take time throughout the day to take breaks, that you can increase your risk of cancer. Uh, not to scare people, but <laughs> if you are completely sedentary like Anne here, you have a very high risk of cancer. Um, but even by adding in a couple of small breaks, and here he's just going for a brief walk, here he's going to get some water, and then he's playing soccer, now his cancer risks have come down. But you don't have to be you know, a major athlete to really decrease your cancer risk. You could just add in a few more breaks, and they don't have to be big breaks. Here he's taking a walking call, um, he's at his standing desk, uh, he's, he's intermittently standing and walking, which is one of the best things to do because you don't want to stand all day either. So just changing up what you're doing and taking breaks can lower your risk of cancer. Seems like a pretty easy change to me. Uh, and the best part is that it doesn't have to be in these one hour bouts that for some reason we decided to design formal exercise around, right? Every little bit of movement counts. That means if you go for a 10 minute walk, that counts. You go for a five minute walk, that counts. And you wanna to aim to get about 60 minutes of activity each day. So preferably more. And that's six minute, six 10 minute walks. If you have a, a walking phone call for 30 minutes, now you've got halfway to your activity for the day. Uh, and Lorenzo and I were actually just talking about this, that we both like to walk and talk uh, when we have meetings. And that's one of the great ways to get to your 10,000 steps a day or better yet, 20,000 steps a day. Uh, more is typically, oops, more is typically better when it comes to this type of gentle, gentle movement. Um, and another way you can do that is by just making small changes. So taking the stairs, I know a lot of times we have high rise buildings and taking stairs is not an option, but there's usually some place where it is an option where you only have to go one or two floors and instead of taking the elevator, take the stairs. That is something I definitely live by. Um, when I was at the School of Public Health at Hopkins, I actually never took the elevator the entire time I was there. Uh, and I'm quite proud of that. And I will tell you that it's part of the reason I was able to keep active because between classes, uh, that was the only time I had to get any movement in my day. So that's what I did. Another thing you can do is even if you don't have a standing desk, you can stand. Um, so this woman here is looking at some plans and she's standing. She's just taking a break from sitting and, and changing what she's doing in the day. And then you've got this woman over here who's kind of gung-ho. This might be more me over here on the side. She's got a standing desk. She's got a balance ball chair, uh, which allows you to work on some core strength and strengthen your back very gently. And she's also taking a movement break to stretch. So you can figure out exactly where this is, you're going to be on this spectrum um, and see what works for you. And then I would recommend trying to increase that throughout time. So just a gradual change. Why else do we care about natural movement? Um, so if you don't do it, you won't be able to do it as you get older. I, it's uh, not to, th to threaten you or to scare you, but it, it is true, the old adage of use it or lose it. So if you want to be able to pick up your grandkids when you are older, then you need to pick things up now, right? If you want to be able to walk up and down the stairs when you're 80 years old, then you need to walk up and down the stairs right now. Uh, just because you can do it right now doesn't mean that you should skip out on it. Um, and you need to get a lot of different kind of movement and exercise. And the NH has this great figure here where you want to do something that's endurance. So 
climbing the steps or going dancing and that's fun too so added balance um, strength picking up your groceries picking up a grandkid those are great things picking up a dog or cat if you're in my case uh, also taking some time to do balance which actually you can multitask and do that on the stairs right so if you're walking up the stairs you are working on your balance so look at that one as being two in one um, and then flexibility is also important we want to be able to dress ourselves when we're older uh, and to easily drive a car and that doesn't mean everybody has to do yoga it could just be you know stretching a little bit throughout the day real simple things uh, just to keep your body loose because motion is lotion so I love this photo. I want to dance with these people. Um, and that's the most important thing. You need to find what moves you, what gets you excited about movement. Um, and I really recommend finding your inner child. It's something that's very difficult in our culture where we kind of, we, we, we need to grow up very quickly. And then we have to maintain these very rigorous mores where we have to sit in our chair and we can't fidget because it's, it's not appropriate. And I would argue that that's not really true, right? Move around relax, think about what a kid would do. They would run and play and have a great time. Uh, and that's really what life is about. Uh, it, it is not about formal exercise even. So uh, we think, oh, we have to go to the gym to work out and that's how we get our exercise. And I would say, no, you really don't have to. You don't have to go to the gym. If you work things in through your entire day, then there's no need to go to the gym. Um, I would also say that if there's something that you love doing at the gym, that's fantastic. I am a devout yogi and I do yoga all the time. I love it. Um, I actually joke that you wouldn't like me if I didn't do yoga. <laughs> so I know that it's very important for me. So that works for me, but it doesn't mean that you need to do one hour of yoga a day. Uh, the most important thing is to listen to your body, listen to your life, what fits into your life. Uh, and also in, in a came with that working out, if you do work out in the morning, fantastic, but that doesn't mean you're off the hook. If you sit all day, you've kind of undone a lot of the good of that workout. So it's really important to keep moving. Every 20 to 30 minutes, take some sort of movement break. And that could just be one thing, right? You just take a, a one quick stretch. Um, I have a link here for some activity break ideas and here are some examples. So maybe every 20 minutes you get up and you march in place and then the next one you neck stretch and the one after that you chair twist. But so throughout the day, you've constantly moved parts of your body and you haven't become rigid. That's what the whole motion is, is lotion idea is about. Another way of thinking about what type of movement you want to do is strength based. So look at your strengths. That's what you enjoy. Uh, what are you hoping to do? What are your aspirations? And that could be, I want to be able to play basketball with my grandkids. Well, then maybe basketball is, is the activity for you um, or also building upon your strengths. Maybe you're not good at basketball, um, but you really enjoy walking or hiking, then that might be a better activity for you. Um, and if you can make it social, so building upon what your community is doing or what your family is doing, that's even better. So playing basketball with your whole family or going on a, a walk where they're, well, what we say in Montgomery County is pogging. That's where you pick up uh, litter as you jog, pogging. Um, so you could go ahead and do that with your family and friends, and that's great for your community. Um, but most importantly, emphasize the positive. So what, what is good for you, what is working for you, and then increase that part of it. Uh, something that I think is kind of crazy for our culture, it's we have a chair culture. Uh, there are chairs everywhere, and we feel very um, obliged to sit in these chairs. And that's not true around the world. This is from Katie Bowman, Nutritious Movement, of different outside the chair postures around the world. And this is what people have been doing for thousands of years without chairs. Um, but in our culture, we feel this need to sit in a chair all the time. And basically, that's, that's a cast. You've cast your body in this shape, and it can't get out of that cast. So we need to let it move around every once in a while. So I say think outside the chair or use it for nutritious movement. You can actually use your chair as a prop to get some good stretching in, um, but don't sit in a chair all day, every day. You will, you will not feel good in the long run. More on natural movement. I, actually taking breaks is really important um, for mental health, right? You need to take a mental break. You need to be like, I, I just need I need a moment to recoup. And you can actually use that as an opportunity for a movement break as well. So take a break at least hourly, 
take a short walk. If that's outside, that's even better. You're getting some sunshine. You might be making some vitamin D. Uh, extra bonus if you're in green space because nature is also really good for you and that's even gonna be more restorative to your yourself. Um, but it could be really simple. Like just get up, do a little stretch, just do a little wiggle, shake, whatever you need to kind of just get moving and, and, and get your mental clarity back. Um, there's also some more formal techniques, what we would call moving meditation. So yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, or Headspace actually now has a whole section of their app. And everyone at GW gets Headspace for free. So you can go in there and get any of these. They have really short workouts or they have just a, a moving meditations where you can go for a walk for five to 15 minutes. Uh, and I would really recommend doing those, particularly if you're having a high stress day. Those are the days you really need to take a mental break and get a little movement in. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about nutrition, which is my area of expertise and I love talking about nutrition. So I'm trying and keep this at a minimum and we'll talk more about nutrition later. But the first thing I just wanna say is there's a great guideline for, for how to eat relatively healthy. That's kind of simplifying things because nutrition can seem overwhelming and I don't think it really is inherently. Um, and this plate here really drives it home that you wanna have mostly vegetables on your plate healthy proteins, which could be legumes, it could be uh, fish, uh, and you do wanna limit your red meat and cheese. You wanna have some fruits as well, get some whole grains in. Don't be too afraid of fat, particularly healthy fat. Uh, avocado is fantastic for you and it's full of fat. And then keep your drink to water. So water is fantastic for you. It has no added sugar, no calories. Uh, a lot of times it also has minerals. It, it, this is really a super food uh, and we often overlook it. So get water, eat mostly plants, um, and it can be that simple. Um, so keep it plant-based. And by plant-based, what we mean is 51% of your diet or more. So there is a movement of using plant-based in a different term, but that's really what a plant-based diet is. It's one that is based in plants. It's not entirely plants, but it's mostly plants. Um, and those plants should be minimally processed. So if you're looking at processed foods, minimally processed would be corn. Processed would be canned corn and ultra processed would be Doritos. So we don't wanna be eating Doritos and occasionally canned corn's totally all right. Um, but really you wanna be focusing on whole corn as, as the basis of your diet. And then we wanna get a lot of variety and eating the rainbow is the easiest way to do that. So all sorts of different colors, including white, because these actually signal different chemicals, different nutrients or phytonutrients in the plants. Uh, and that leads it to a diverse diet. Uh, and a diverse diet, as many of you may know from me, is the number one marker of a healthy gut microbiome. And how do you get a healthy gut microbiome? You wanna aim for at least 30 different plants per week. And that may sound like a lot, uh, but if you think about it, it's, it's just having a, a good variety with, throughout the week. So rather than having broccoli twice a week, only have broccoli once a week. And you can keep repeating things week to week, but make sure that you're getting a lot of different vegetables. And here's a great list to get started with, uh, as well as some explanation as how they may be uh, beneficial in prevention of cancer. So how do you eat healthy? One is to prioritize your nutrition. And one way to do that is meal prepping. So make your, a bunch of meals on Sunday or when you're making dinner, make extra than you have lunch. Do it in batches and save your effort. Um, you also wanna keep healthy food and snacks on hand and keep them at eye level. So have a fruit bowl on the countertop and that's your, your snack. Uh, and then if you do wanna have you know, less healthy snacks around, keep them in the pantry where you can't see them uh, and you'll be less likely to eat them. It's, it sounds really kind of almost silly, but it really does work. If you have healthy snacks at eye level and you're hungry, you're probably just gonna grab that and eat it and not think about what's in the pantry. Another element is staying hydrated. Um, and we often overlook that as part of nutrition, but it is really important to have enough water. Uh, and one reason is if you are hydrated, you actually will tend to not overeat as much because uh, sometimes we confuse thirst and hunger. Our body is not great at differentiating thirst and hunger. So often we feel hungry, but it's actually that we're thirsty. So keeping water and staying hydrated will help maintain a healthy balance. And then I've got some recipe sources down here. Uh, these are all done by RDs, registered dietitians. So they're healthy and you know actually backed by science, but they're also relatively easy and they have great recipes about meal prepping as well. Okay, so ultimately, what do we need to do with nutrition? Really, we need to listen to our body. It's, it's, it's true with all aspects of whole health. Listen to what it's telling you. Are you hungry? Well, then eat as long as you're hydrated, because we talked about that. Um, and it, 
if you don't, there are ramifications to that. And here's a great example. Um, this person here is a dieter. This person here is what we call an intuitive eater. The dieter doesn't eat pizza at, all, at the office party, but really wants to. So instead, the dieter goes home and overeats at dinner, trying and satisfying that craving. So the dieter denied themselves, but later was so overcome by the cravings that they probably ended up eating more than they would have if they just had the pizza at the party. The intuitive eater says, you know what, I'm hungry. I'm going to have a piece of pizza and I'm not going to feel guilty about it. And because they did have that piece of pizza, when they go home, they end up having a very light dinner because they're not as hungry because they did have that piece of pizza. So that's listening to your body. That is what intuitive eating is. And I have a resource down here for more about intuitive eating if that's something that appeals to you. Another thing we need to listen to our body is, are we tired? There's lots of reasons we can get tired. Sometimes it's we need a snack. Sometimes it's it's we need something else. So we need to really figure that out. Do we just need a quick walk, stretch or wiggle to kind of get some exercise uh, induced energy? Or maybe we are actually feeling sapped and we need to have a restorative meditation or to do a really quick uh, Qigong or Tai Chi routine. Um, but maybe it is a small snack. Uh, and so if you are going to have a snack, I really recommend keeping that under 200 calories because then it's not going to take away too much from the calories you would have at each meal. Okay, moving on to our next topic, support and belonging. Um, so your support system is actually a part of your stress management. Uh, and I think most of us intuitively realize that it's important to have a support system, a social support system for stress management. But sometimes particularly when we're very stressed and we have chronic stress, we, we don't foster that. We're too busy, right? I don't have time to talk to my friend. I don't have time to Zoom call with my mom. And that's the worst thing that you could be doing at that time because you need your support. Um, and there's research that shows this is the case. Those who feel more connected have lower rates of anxiety and depression. They have higher self-esteem more empathy. So they feel more empathetic towards people, which is really important in healthcare. We all want to be empathetic, right? Um, they're, they're more trusting and cooperative. So they're working better in teams and their teams actually say that they're more trustworthy and cooperative too. So it's a nice reciprocal slide. And if you don't have that support system, all of these things are going to be a problem. So let's make sure we're taking care of ourselves and also then taking care of each other. Um, what's really interesting about all of this research is that it's not related to how many friends or how many groups you're in. It's really about quality of connection. So if you are really busy, just make sure there's that one person you always have that you're reaching out to or that one group that you're always participating in because it's really valuable to you. So prioritize how you maintain that support network. Um, and then, you know, there are other ways of doing this as well. So you could have a sense of oneness beyond individuals or even groups. Uh, and one way to do this is a loving kindness meditation. Uh, which it, there's an example over here. May you be happy, may you be free, may you be safe. So thinking about any individual, thinking about a group, thinking about yourself, just having well wishes, good thoughts, and perhaps prayers for others can also help with the sense of support and belonging. Um, so that may also be important for your stress management. So how does this all tie back into whole health? Well, I think you'll probably see we've hit on most of these. We talked about natural movement. We talked a little bit about the environment, nutrition, recharge, support and belonging, and all of this goes into prevention. But how do we do it in reality? How, how do we do whole health? And it goes back to what we were just talking about. Listen to your body. Know the signs of too much stress in your body and ask for help before you think you need it. So if, if you think that you, you're doing fine, that's great, but just make sure you realize that if you start to slip, that's the time to ask for help. Um, we'll be here for you if you if you really have already gotten to the point where you need help, but it's easier for us to help you if you haven't quite slid off yet. Um, so what are some warning signs for this? Muscle tension, headaches, upset stomach, or difficulty sleeping. So if you're having any of those signs, then maybe you're struggling a little bit and you need to either reach out to your support system or reach out to someone like Lorenzo or myself who can assist you. Um, and above all else, be compassionate with yourself and as well as others. Uh, we can be our own worst enemy. Uh, if, if some of the things we say to ourselves, we said to other people, we would be appalled. And I think that's something that we need to, to give ourselves that compassion that we're human beings and human beings make mistakes and errors and that's perfectly okay. It's all about trying to move in a direction of continual improvement. So one practice that is really helpful in terms of whole health comes from the Whole Health Institute. It's called Pause, Notice, Choose or PNC. So pause, you take a deep breath. Notice, 
What do you think, feel, and sense right now in this moment? Choose, what will you do next? So now making that decision, whatever it is, if it's, am I hungry? Do I need to work out? Um, am I gonna yell at this person because they're driving me crazy? It's much easier to make a healthy decision after you've paused, noticed, and then chosen. And there are a lot of great audio only podcasts from the Whole Health Institute about exactly how to do this. And let me just check my time, make sure I'm doing okay on time. Um, We're gonna do a quick uh, practice of PNC through breath and it's audio only. So you're just gonna hear it through my speakers once I hit play. Pause, notice and choose with focus on breath. Let's pause for a moment. Take a deep breath. Take another deep breath. Find a comfortable position. Notice the support of the chair or the floor. Notice if you feel relaxed or not. And allow your eyes to close or set a soft gaze around the room. Remember to maintain attitudes of non-judging, just noticing. This is a time where you may want to let go of business or life's concerns if you choose. Now just notice your breath wherever you experience it. Don't try to change it, just notice it. Feel the breath as completely as possible. The inhaling, the pause, and exhaling of breath. might be easier to focus on your belly during the experience of breathing. Do what's comfortable for you. And when you notice that your attention is somewhere else, Congratulate yourself for noticing and gently return your focus to your breath if you choose. You're now practicing noticing and choosing. You can continue to practice this as many times as you need to get skilled at doing this. Okay, so that is just a little bit of an intro it's about halfway through a practice, but I'm sure you all already feel a little bit more at peace and at ease. Um, that stress level has come down. I guarantee your cortisol levels all came down. Maybe even your blood pressure came down. Um, and that took all of two and a half minutes. Uh, so I think you can see where you could squeeze this into your life. It doesn't need to be something that's taking all this time. If you could just take, I mean, heck, even 30 seconds, if you could just take a few breaths in and out, that is gonna make a world of difference for you. So that is the end of my talk portion. Uh, I will take some questions, but first I wanna put a plug in for the GW Integrative Medicine Podcast, where we talk a lot about all of the topics I talked about today and many others. Um, so please do subscribe anywhere you get your podcast, or you can find it on our website, uh, GW Integrative Medicine. If you just Google it, it will pop right up. Uh Lee, I just wanted to thank you for that uh, presentation. That was great. I mean, there's a number of things. I mean, I could probably just keep on talking, uh, but I'm, I'm gonna let's open it up for uh, questions. So anybody, any uh, 
thoughts that you want to ask uh, Lee in regards to uh, whole whole person care and wellness? And you can either type it in the chat or unmute yourself. Oh, I see Miranda just bought a hula hoop. That's fantastic, Miranda. We should all probably get a hula hoop and have a little <laughs> bit more childlike activity. So um, Lee, it's Leslie, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Um, actually, I went through your lecture. I was like, I'm going to go sit outside and listen to this. <laughs> so nice. Um, that was from your recommendation. Can you talk a little bit about how nutrition and stress kind of intersect and how good or bad nutrition can help as a stress reducer? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, uh, there, everything I talked about today is, could and will be its own standalone workshop. And your question there could also be its own standalone workshop. So we'll just tease you a little bit with what you can do in terms of nutrition and stress. Um, and one of the things that I think of as being kind of miraculous in terms of nutrition and stress is that magnesium, which is a mineral that we get from our food, is actually absolutely crucial in our stress response and is actually anti-stress. So if you aren't getting enough magnesium in your diet, your stress levels will be higher. Um, and, and, and flip side, adding magnesium to your diet will decrease your stress levels. And that's just with one single mineral. So now think about everything else there is in nutrition and how that can affect the body. Not to mention the fact that nutrition really is the building blocks of your body and all of the enzymes and all of the pathways and the processes in your body. Um, so if you aren't getting enough of any one thing that something in the system has gone wrong, something is not going to function at its best and thus you are not going to function at your best. Um, so that's why nutrition needs to be priority. Um, I don't think it needs to be super complicated. Like while magnesium is powerful, I don't think you need to worry so much about my magnesium. As long as you're getting a diverse diet, mostly plants, um, you're trying to keep it whole foods, um, most things will kind of fall into place. Uh, magnesium may be one you want to consider a supplement. I personally take a magnesium supplement because I have a high stress lifestyle and I know I need to take better care of myself. So that's something that I do to kind of ensure I'm getting enough magnesium. Um, that and actually the, the food that we're eating, it doesn't have as many nutrients in it as it used to. So it's like this in the seventies, we had very healthy soil and we haven't taken great care of our soil since then. And so the food that we produce is actually lower in some of these nutrients. And that is part of the reason where we see malnutrition, even in people who are having, you know, a moderately good diet. They're not, they're not taking great care of themselves, but they wouldn't have had, had malnutrition with this moderately good diet 30, 40 years ago. I just wanted to chime in in regards to stress and mental health. That's, uh, we're going to be having more lectures on that, but, um, huge, huge link. And again, one way in which I think about it, everything that Lee has outlined gets into one, how we maintain what our stress response. And in the midst of the pandemic, many of us have, all, all of society has not only had significant stressors and stress injury, uh, we have in also likely, if you're like me, you incorporated some habits that do not promote the best stress response. Uh, and that consequently can lead to us to have chronic stress conditions or reactions such as burnout, depression, increased substance use, post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder. So this link between stress, immunity, inflammation, uh, all of it starts with just as Lee outlined all of it. So I think that's a great question. Yes, I, I agree. Um, and actually ties in with the cross-disciplinary bio, uh, bio seminar that we're doing about how inflammation is at the root of many of the chronic mm -hmm. diseases that we, we suffer from now. And most of us have some sort of level of chronic inflammation. So if there's something we can do to calm that inflammation, which is all these things I talked about today, you're not only helping your mental health, but you're helping prevent cancer. You're helping reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, it's really something that will, will affect every aspect of your health. And Lee, we have a question here in regards to the role of vitamin D, but I just wanted to add one other point um, for those of us uh, in the field of mental health, particularly myself, uh, in terms of counsel liaison or psychosomatic medicine. When you start to think of clinical depression as a whole body condition that has its roots in uh, uh, immunity and inflammation, you're going to advance all of the different things in which you can do to not only treat depression, but the whole, all of your body. So again, more cutting edge, we think of depression as an entire body response, as opposed to just strictly with emotions and your moods, even though that is, if you will, usually the leading factor. It's not, you, you can start to think about it in different ways, but Lee, please, vitamin D and mental health, if you wish to elaborate. 
Yeah, I will. Though I'm going to first make a comment on that is that we are a human system. Mm -hmm. And if you only treat one part of the system and there are other elements that are broken, then the system is still broken. And I think that's exactly what you're saying in terms of depression is we end up focusing only on a small portion system, even though other elements are still broken. Um, And if we can fix all of those, then we're really restoring well-being. Okay, I'm going to get greedy, Lee, because I, I'm literally, I'm, I'm walking and jumping up right now. That is, for everybody listening, that is, if I had to pick the number one mi- challenge or mistake that people make when they're addressing their mental health, they do not do that. They just think strictly neuron, and they don't think body in terms of the connected system. So, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm going to step back. Please, vitamin D. Laura's been patient. Vitamin D. Yes, great question, Laura. Um, so vitamin D is an immune modulatory hormone. And that means it actually affects the way your immune system works. Um, and the immune system is all about balance. If there's any sort of movement, it needs to be for a reason, right? So if you have an infection, you need inflammation. It needs to come up and it needs to work. But if you don't have an infection and you are chronically inflamed, that's not productive. Um, and vitamin D sort of improves the balance. So if you need a robust immune response, it will help with that. Um, But if you don't need an immune response and you have this chronic inflammation, it actually decreases chronic inflammation. It it restores you to homeostasis back to balance. Mm. Um, So in that case, it's really important for this inflammatory model of mental health. Um, However, because it's a hormone, it also has really broad effects uh, that go beyond that. So it'd be like if you didn't have enough testosterone or enough estrogen, you would know that there's a lot of different effects you would see from not having enough vitamin D. And it has been linked to a number of different mental health disorders as well as depression. Um, Though I would say that it's a little bit confounded by the fact that the majority of us get the majority of vitamin D from the sun. Uh, And there's a lot of health benefits to going outside. So there's a bit of a confounding, uh, as much as I love vitamin D, going outside may be the true answer uh, because you're getting vitamin D. um, The sun actually helps relief endorphins. Being in nature has incredible health and especially mental health benefits. So the best way is probably to go outside for a little mental health break, get your vitamin D, get some sunshine. Um, But that being said, we, we sometimes have a hard time doing that. And so that's where vitamin D supplements come in. And some of the research has shown some benefit for vitamin D, for vitamin D supplements if you have a deficiency. So if you don't have enough vitamin D, a supplement does seem to help. If you already get enough, it didn't seem to do much of anything. And Lee, I would also echo, I mean, in terms of the power of the sun and vitamin D, uh, in psychiatry, we think about seasonal affective disorder, but I would challenge all of our colleagues and clinicians, PhDs, PAs, uh, PTs, OTs, MDs, staff, Um, I argue that there's already a mild form of seasonal affective disorder that occurs when when we shift and we all go to work in the dark and we leave and go home in the dark. And no one is happier than I am than when the sun starts coming up because I can start to feel the energy and spirit of the medical center as a whole rise. I mean, and people can challenge me on this, but I have, I I always say when, when, when the, when the, uh, you know, when, when spring comes, the mood rises. When things, when the winter and fall come, that's also can have a significant effect on mood. So I, I yeah, sun, I'm a big believer in the sun. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point because that's not even just seasonal. Um, yeah. Part of the problem is we're spending so much time inside that we are missing the time that the sun is out there. Um, so prioritizing getting some sun exposure, preferably before 10 a.m. So we reset our circadian rhythm, but really any time, right? If you have a five minute lunch break and you can go outside, do that. it it will make you feel better. Great questions, please. Other questions anyone has for Lee? Lee, I'd, uh, I'll wait a minute. I'll wait a minute. Okay, no one jumped in. All right, I have a question. Uh, I want you to elaborate a little bit more. Um, Just in regards to that, uh, motion is lotion and motion is self-care. Can you just maybe just even just a, a couple more things, maybe even uh, just further elaboration or even tips in terms of, you already talked a lot about that, but how you incorporate that into your life? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not necessarily easy because our world is designed to stop movement. Everything we do is designed to stop movement, right? You sit in your meeting um, and you don't fidget. So you have to be really intentional about it. Um, I have a standing desk and I, I'm i actually standing right now. <laughs> I've been standing this whole talk. Uh, and then afterwards I will sit down on my balance ball. Um, and once I get tired of sitting, then I'll walk around. And it's it's just about changing throughout the day and making sure you're getting as many different types 
of movement. And one of the ways that Katie Bowman describes it that I love is she says to think about movement like you would think about nutrition. Um, we talked about diversity of diet and getting different nutrients. Think of each type of movement as a, a, as a nutrient. So if you're only getting run slash walk, sit and stand, then you're only getting three vitamins. But then there's also swimming and there's also stretching and there is um, squatting and all these other different movements that we aren't getting. So basically you are deficient in those types of movement. Um, so getting the different types of movement is feeding your body in the same way that getting different types of nutrients feeds your body. Lee, I thank you for that. And one of the things that, I mean, I think I, we had a, a, a people that came in and out, but some folks I want to say are students. And I did want to say one of the things when I talk with students or faculty or residents, uh, one, we, when you've had a setback or, or inevitably a challenge, one thing I always think about is the power of movement in life. Make no mistake about it. It's movement and growth. And if you've ever had a time when your thoughts feel stagnant or you're stuck or you're like, Mm, mm, mm. And you notice you you may notice you even have stopped physically moving. You've become sedentary. But I would challenge you if you just activate, if you start moving, I would challenge you that your thoughts are also going to start moving and they're also going to get fluid. So make no mistake about it. Um, if you similar to what we Lee masterfully kind of gave us that and walked us through that exercise in terms of PNC, where we we controlled our response. If you so not only can we bring a calming response, we can bring a certain level of energy and spirit to our thoughts and fluidity if we just if we just move. So that's that's another lecture topic. So, but uh, I do want to be sensitive to time. Um, if everyone, if you uh, and I'm going to put it back in the chat. If you could please uh, just. Uh, Take a moment and fill out the Survey Monkey uh, poll so that we can certainly improve uh, the offerings from the lecture series and uh, just in things that you want to hear more about. Uh, we are recording this, so this will be um, available. Um, let's see, uh, Laura does a seven minute workout on YouTube. Uh, okay, the AI cool. of YouTube has already figured it out. I love it, Laura. <laughs> that's, that's, awesome. that's one of the good things about AI there. <laughs> Usually it's not so great, but that was good. That is good. All right. So uh, do please fill out the survey. And also, uh, at, uh, if anyone is having, please do not hesitate to go to the uh, G. Well Center for Healthcare Professionals for links in regards to wellness resources. Uh, do not hesitate to, and I'm going to put it in the chat right now, contact myself. Um, if you have any questions in regards to mental health or if I can be of support to you in any way, shape or form, please just send me an email and I'll be more than happy to get in contact with you immediately. And I want to thank uh, everybody for attending this, um, this uh, our first uh, lecture. And do please, uh, we are recording this, so we're going to disseminate it across multiple platforms. Disseminate it to any of your colleagues um, or, 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 or friends or whomever that you feel so this might be useful. And I look forward to uh, seeing all of you hopefully at future lectures. All right. Thank you all so very much. I'm going to stop the recording now.